fresh start. So thanks for the uh, invitation to be here and tell something about the work that we did over the last uh, couple of years, mainly in the context of the uh, Versatile Dynamics project, which was uh, a project funded by the Dutch uh, government. Um, in particular, I would like uh, uh, to acknowledge uh, the work done by Joshua Afrasta, who uh, is uh, almost uh, finished with their PhD, uh, so the defense will be somewhere beginning next year. And in particular, I would also like to mention uh, the contribution of Martin Vallan, um, who was the one who basically involved me in the, in the, the art of hydrodynamic modeling. And I think together over the last 10, uh, 12 years, we basically worked on the exploitation of hydrodynamic models in uh, geodetic and hydrographic uh, application. And this basically is, is one of those applications. So before going into the details, I would like to uh, tell a bit, let's say, the way uh, about the way we went and how we got here. And that all started uh, when I did my PhD, started my PhD at uh, Delft University of Technology, which has the main aim to estimate a new marine geoid for the Dutch uh, economic exclusive economic zone. And essentially we want to uh, make use of satellite radar altimetry uh, as one of the data sets. And we would like to exploit the hydrodynamic models developed by Deltares uh, for doing the correction of the dynamic topography, which I indicated here with Zeta. And the basic question that we had is to which vertical reference do the model water levels refer to? And this question may seem quite uh, simple, but it's a little bit less obvious than you may think if you have a look on the uh, model equations. Because the model equations just say that the gravity acceleration, which is assumed to be constant, only acts in the vertical direction, which means that the reference surface is an equipotential surface. And then, of course, the, the key question is, in case um, you would exploit a satellite uh, radar altimeter and you measure the height of the sea surface relative with respect to an ellipsoid, and you subtract this dynamic topography, well, will you then end up with the geoid, with the geoid height? And this question, is uh, the answer to this question is well that's only the case if and only if all forcings in the model are included and in let's say um, our application that we worked on uh, or the models that we worked on at that time this was not the case because one of the key components the paraclinic forcing was ignored uh, at that time which is not so relevant for storm surge uh, modeling these are fast processes um, so you run the model for the coming few days, uh, but they have a very important contribution to the mean dynamic topography, so the, to the slow uh, contributions of the water level variability. So uh, we had to, to do some work in order to get this or to realize this reference surface in an unambiguous uh, way. Now you may wonder, isn't the vertical reference of the modeled water level uh, not important uh, for the modelers? And well, there's a long uh, story uh, for this. I think, uh, first of all, this depends on the application and uh, the way you evaluate your model output. And modelers have a whole bunch of, let's say, strategies available, uh, how they can avoid these kind of uh, issues. Uh, but definitely, there are a number of applications for which the vertical reference does uh, matter and for which it's actually very important. And here, what I learned in the, the, the 10 years uh, that I worked with these, uh, these guys is that they typically apply these vertical data and transformation with what I would refer to as a non geodetic mindset. And to illustrate that, I would like to uh, point back to the example that I gave uh, during the last uh, EGU meeting, uh, where I pointed to a, a, a publication that was uh, uh, published a few years ago by these uh, authors on uh, the topic of uh, sea level projection or extreme sea level projections for the 21st uh, century. And what they were interested in is, well, what areas would be affected and what areas would be, would be flooded? And of course, if you start to answer these uh, questions, 
you get one way or the other involved in the issues related to the vertical uh, referencing of the models and observations. And here is what I say about this. So um, if you zoom in, uh, the, the first thing that I mentioned is, well, we have a, a merit dam that we use for the uh, land areas that we want to assess uh, for flooding. And basically, the vertical datum of that DEM is EGM 96. Well, the question, of course, is would that be still, after we have launched uh, Grace and Kochi, would it still be an appropriate vertical uh, reference? I think for us, the answer is clearly no, but for them, it's uh, uh, still something uh, accepted. But apart from that, um, well, they realize that in order to adjust for the datum shift uh, with respect to the model uh, water levels and uh, this uh, uh, merit dam, they have to um, uh, add the mean dynamic topography. And if you then zoom in to what they exact, uh, exactly did, they point to a publication which was published by uh, Rio et al. in Geophysical Research Letter in 2014. And you check uh, uh, what they did and actually what they say about the geoid in this uh, reference is that it is based on uh, Kochi data. Um, and uh, well, they also acknowledge the fact that uh, they had to apply some filtering to uh, get rid of uh, uh, commission and omission errors in the in the dual model. Well, without going into the details how this filtering was applied, uh, they did at least uh, uh, something. But if you look to the overall procedure, there are a couple of things you may wonder in this whole procedure. And I again bring it up just to emphasize that uh, these uh, people that are working on these models, they do very important work with very big impact. But if it comes to these geodetic issues, they need our help. And I think they definitely need a globally unified height reference frame and also the support uh, from our side to implement this frame for their applications. But coming back to the uh, topic of hydrodynamic modeling, um, there are other um, uh, examples of applications these guys work on for which they need a proper vertical reference uh, frame. And in this context, uh, I think they also have something to offer to us. And this is what we basically exploited. Let me first introduce this application. So, in the past, when they considered the assimilation of water level observations in the hydrodynamic models, Basically, what they did was they adjust, they applied a simulation of water level components. So they were only calibrating the tidal component of the model or the search component of the water level, um, the search component of the model. So they split the total water levels into separate contributors and do the assimilation for those separate contributors. This is actually not ideal situation. You observe the total water level. And in fact, you want to assimilate that directly into the model to avoid all the issues you have in decomposing the water levels into separate uh, contributors. And this is basically what we aim for. So the direct assimilation of observed total water levels. But these applications require very uh, high accurate vertical reference frame. And the reason is that these models are extremely sensitive to small errors introduced by the uh, uh, different or errors in the vertical references of the time cages. Even small errors will introduce false currents into the model, spurious water level circulation, which isn't physical, and then your model collapse. We tested this and this indeed turned out uh, the case. If you ask me what would be the order of uh, magnitude in terms of accuracy, we think it's about one centimeter, but it's not um, um, well, very uh, robust estimate. The thing is that for this application, such an accurate vertical reference frame isn't available, even not in, in Europe. Uh, so there can be different options, how you could bring all observations and the model to a common reference. A common uh, or a very uh, straightforward uh, strategy would be to exploit GNSS leveling which requires, first of all, an accurate uh, 
quasi Geode model or Geode model. And the best one we have available is ETG 2015, which has centimeter to sub-decimeter accuracy, depending on where you are. But besides, we also need the GNSS measurements at all the time cages, in particular also the offshore platforms and offshore time cages and the time cages on islands, which are important uh, for, the, uh, for the data of which we want to assimilate in the model because of their location. So this was a no-go. The alternative way would be to exploit the European Vertical Reference Frame uh, 2019. This model, um, again, it lacks the accuracy, but it also lacks uh, the coverage. And you may wonder why it would lack coverage. Well, the thing is, uh, if you look to the, uh, the, 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 uh, the data that is underlying this network, it's the Unified European Leveling Network, uh, it has coverage over a large part of the European mainland, including uh, the UK, but we lack, for example, uh, uh, Ireland. Ireland and many of these offshore platforms uh, in the North Sea, they are not included. And the key problem is, of course, that the spirit leveling technique, which is used to establish this European unified European leveling network, it cannot cross large water bodies. And this is where model-based hydrodynamic leveling comes in view because model-based hydrodynamic leveling can do this. And basically what we do with model-based hydrodynamic leveling is we exploit the fact that hydrodynamic models are quite good in representing slopes or water level differences. So they have a problem in representing absolute water levels, but in terms of water level differences or slopes in water levels, they do a pretty good uh, job. And basically what you then can do is use these models to establish leveling connections between time cages, which in turn can be used to transfer heights to an offshore platform or to a time cage of an island. Or, and that is what we tried, you can establish uh, leveling connections between time cages and combine this with uh, an existing leveling network. And in our context, we used it uh, to strengthen the Euro unified European uh, leveling network. And together, so using the combined data sets, we uh, computed a non-official new realization of the European vertical reference system. And I say non-official because this new realization that we computed will not be published. Uh, it's uh, not... Uh, um, yeah, this is something I, I needed to stress also from Martina Sacco, uh, who was involved in this work. So let me go to the uh, functional and uh, stochastic model. So basically what we add is the potential difference between height, be height uh, benchmarks that are in the vicinity of uh, time cages and that are part of the uh, ULM uh, network. And these potential differences can be computed as a sum of five terms. We have uh, the contribution from the, or the potential difference from the height benchmark to the time gate zero, from the time gate zero to the mean water level. This is coming from observations. Then we have the potential difference in the mean water level at the two time cages between which we want to establish a connection. And this is term is, is colored in blue because this is the only term that comes from the hydrodynamic model. And then, of course, you have the two contributions at the other side. When I say mean water level, um, I mean a water level that is averaged basically over an arbitrary time period. We can choose any time period. In our application, we typically use the summer months for the simple reason that then the performance of the model is better. And the uh, uh, winter months, you have uh, storm searches and then the, the performance is, is, is lower. If you look to the stochastic model, of course, we have uh, again the sum of these five uh, contributions. Um, well, the uh, terms, uh, the contributions from uh, term one, two, four, and five are obvious. The uh, middle term that comes from the model is obtained by error propagation, for which we need the uh, full variance covariance matrix of the model derived mean water level. And more particular, it's the model-derived summer mean water level 
and the coastal tide gauges because we have in our application we mainly use uh, coastal tide gauges. And this matrix was empirically uh, derived and we obtained it by um, analysis of uh, differences uh, between the summer mean water level and um, tide gauges um, obtained from the model and uh, the observation. So all the details of this analysis can be uh, obtained from the reference that I include in the slide. What we learned from it is, first of all, there are indeed spatial correlations. So model errors are spatially correlated, which is very obvious because the forcing, etc., everything is, is correlated. We also observe quite a large uh, nugget effect, which is um, partly introduced by the the errors that we have in the vertical referencing of the tide gauges, which for estimating this uh, uh, noise model is a key requirement. The next question is, uh, that goes more to the implication, uh, uh, implementation, so which tide gauges can be connected? Well, basically, if we would have access to a model that covers, in our case, all European waters, we could connect any pair of tide gauges at least if they are if they are included uh, in the model domain. So that would mean we would go basically from uh, somewhere in the Mediterranean uh, all the way up to the to the Baltic Sea without any problem. Um, of course, running such a high resolution high resolution model is computationally very expensive, and it's also not a, there are models available covering this area, but High resolution model with good accuracy that are well calibrated is a different story. So, what we did was uh, basically we split the model into this domain into subdomains. And uh, for this study, we basically have access to a model covering the Northeast Atlantic, North Sea, and Modern Sea. This was uh, maintained and developed by Deltaris. And in a later stage, we also got access to a model that was developed for the uh, Baltic Sea from our co uh, colleagues at Tallinn uh, Univ Technical University. So for two, those two models, uh, we have quite a number of tide gauges uh, available. Um, and we only use those tide gauges at which the model has good performance. You have to be aware, many of the tide gauges are in harbors or behind structures, and they're you may have very local dynamics that the models cannot resolve. Uh, and this is something to be checked. So we don't need, uh, uh, basically, a model that has good performance everywhere. Of course, we also need reliable time series, uh, ideally over longer uh, time periods. And then suppose we have n time cases in a certain model domain. We can only establish n minus 1 independent connections because we and we cannot allow uh, closed circuits that would uh, cause uh, problems uh, in the uh, adjustment. But these uh, connections can be uh, established in a huge number of ways. So it's n times uh, n to the power n minus 2. So this is a bit too much uh, to evaluate, in particular if uh, n is on the, in the order of a few uh, hundred. Uh, so what we applied was a heuristic search algorithm to identify the connections one by one. Yeah. So here are more uh, zoomed in and some details of the models that we used. Uh, so for the Baltic Sea, we had uh, access to the Nemo Nordic model. Uh, uh, we had 50 tight gauges and the simulation period was 2007. 2019, so this was the averaging uh, period that we used. For the Northwest European Continental Shelf, we made use of the 3D Dutch Continental Shelf model, uh, which is, as I said, already developed by Nantaris. We had 76 time cages, and the averaging period is different. And I want to stress that we don't allow for connections between the Baltic and the Northeast, uh, Northwest European Continental Shelf. So I want to quickly show the results. So um, what we did was we combined this ULN data with these two hydrodynamic leveling data sets. Uh, we estimated uh, variance factors, and so variance component estimation to get the relative weighting factors correctly. And what we learned is that 
uh, the hydrodynamic leveling data set were slightly downgraded. If you look to the impact, so in terms of the adjusted uh, uh, geopotential numbers of the high benchmarks uh, between the ULM only solution, so that is only based on ULM data, and the one that includes hydrodynamic leveling data, we basically see an impact uh, in the UK and in France. Around the Baltic, the uh, contribution is, is negligible, I would say negligible, it's really small. Um, and this can be explained by the uh, poor performance uh, of the uh, model there. But let's have a look in the results in more detail of what we obtained in France and uh, the UK. So if you look to the uh, validation uh, data set that we have available, so it's basically GNSS leveling, um, and we look at the uh, difference, so the residual uh, normal height, uh, that we obtain for this point, we see there is a large strand, uh, north-south uh, trend uh, in the network. This was well known, uh, and that was also the reason, uh, I think, why uh, in the UK they uh, abandoned uh, their leveling network at all. But when we add our leveling uh, connections, this was our result. So basically, by just adding a few leveling connections to the, uh, or by connecting the UK time cages to the European, uh, the, the, the time cages on the European mainland, we basically got rid of this uh, slope. In France, uh, this is the, the, the situation. Uh, when you look at the UN only solution, uh, there is quite a strong uh, trend. It's not so large as in the UK, but it's still quite a, a large uh, signal uh, present. And by adding uh, hydrodynamic leveling data, we basically get a reduction uh, along the cost. So if I toggle between the two uh, figures, you see there's a clear reduction in the numbers. Well, the results of this uh, study uh, will be, uh, appear soon in a publication in Journal of Geodesy, which is currently uh, in press. So there you can read every uh, detail of how we managed to obtain this solution. So where are we now and where do we, where to go? So for me, the technique has proven potential. Uh, there's still many things to do. Uh, we need to account for vertical land motion. We need to account for long-term uh, sea level variability and the tide cages. We need uh, to establish connections to Ireland and other islands offshore platforms. We also would like to readjust uh, this uh, 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 height system uh, by including data uh, in the Mediterranean and Black Sea, and ideally we would be able to combine uh, these uh, basins. There's quite a number of steps we can make in order to further improve the models. You have to be aware that these models are developed for storm surge uh, prediction, which is a completely different application from what we consider here. So maybe we can uh, increase local resolution in the time cage, we can improve bathymetry, we can work on forcing, we can, well, whatever, there's a whole list uh, uh, to work on. Um, and the next thing that is uh, quite high on my wish list is why should we stick to Europe? Uh, basically, there are models, uh, similar type of models, that cover the entire world ocean. So basically, we could also enable or establish uh, uh, leveling connections between tide cages at different continents. And well, I just had a quick check on uh, the uh, points included in the IHRF. Uh, 26 points are co-located with the tide cage. So basically, we could establish potential differences between those points and use uh, or use it. In the, yeah, would basically allow us to verify. Uh, uh, the potential differences obtained by other techniques, but we could also use it for network densification. Just an outlook. So, for me, model-based hydrodynamic leveling is, is really a multidisciplinary thing. Um, you need involvement of oceanographers and geologists in order to get this operation. We need to have people that know very well what is happening at the time cages, at uh, the data sites, uh, in terms of vertical land motion, in terms of how these time cages are uh, um, connected to the uh, mainland high network, and also how they are, whether they are part of the ULM uh, at all, which requires uh, 
given the model domain and strong international collaboration, but I hope I convince you that it, such an enterprise is, is, is worth uh, the effort. And my last message is, if you're interested to join, well, please contact me. Thanks. Thank you. Are there questions or comments? No? <laughs> questions? No. no, no. Uh, I think this is a very interesting topic. Uh, we have to identify the best ways, the, the, the best ways to exploit it at all. So uh, we, we have to think and to talk. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Yep. Uh, so thank you for the presentation. I would ask uh, a question regarding the uh, type or sensors uh, observations, I mean. So uh, you have used type gauges only, I understand. And you have done this old modeling and uh, uncertainty factorization and everything uh, only based on observations of type gauges. Uh, what if, if you want to extend it to other observations, especially you have other geodetic observations like genesis reflectometry, which provides also uh, the sea level. Yep. So uh, have you seen or do you have any prospect to extend uh, this study to also multi-sensor, you know, uh, investigations. Yeah. Well, there's. Uh, thanks for the question. So, um, as I said, uh, what we are interested in is uh, coastal water levels. So this is, let's say, our key application. We have developed uh, and assessed these models also for using altimetry data. Right? They cover all the oceans. Um, but the noise model and the characteristics of this noise model are fundamentally different from what you observe in the. Uh, um, uh, coastal waters. The performance of the model and the dynamics of the model are different in the near coastal waters. So we are really talking about uh, the first kilometer, ex uh, first few kilometers from the coastline, and then we, we saw differences. GNSS reflecting with three, we haven't considered, but this would be a valid uh, option in particular if it allows us to get closer to the coast. So. Yes, so we, we did uh, incorporate altimetry, um, GNSS reflectometry, not yet, but could be a very valuable addition. Thank you.